Welcome to the Next Gen Podcast. Stepping up to the microphone are your hosts, Bryson Wright and Alex Winton. They got next, so let's get to the show. What is up, everybody? Welcome into the Next Gen Podcast here on the Bluff City Media Podcast Network. As always, I'm your host, Bryson Wright, and I'm with my co-host, Alex Winton. And we got a lot to get to tonight, but we got to start with the Grizzlies and the Lakers playing uh, on Wednesday night. And I, the Grizzlies lost the game, but I think the biggest storyline, obviously, coming into that game and coming out of that game was the return of Brandon Clark. Brandon Clark had been out for over a year since he got hurt against the Nuggets I think that was March 3rd, 2023. So, like, he'd been out for over a year rehabbing and everything like that. Um, really a testament to how hard he works that he was able to get back in, like, just over a year. Because we've seen the Achilles injury be something that has people miss multiple seasons or part of, you know what I mean? So, he missed, you know, the end of last season and then most of this year. But he's now back uh and early on, you know, I think the main thing that I noticed was that he he looked like as athletic, you know, it didn't seem like there was like a huge drop off of anything. Maybe he was rusty, you know, obviously, but the the rebounding was there. The little floater push shot was there. Uh, I thought he was active overall. And I think that, you know, this stretch, if we can just get in some rhythm, we'll get to see like the version of Brandon Clark we're used to seeing. Uh, but, I, I mean, for a first game, I don't think it was bad. I think he had six points, five rebounds. Uh, did a lot of good things, like I said, just having that activity. I think the Grizzlies have missed his activity since he's been gone. I mean, obviously, with them having their rebounding struggles all year, I think Brandon Clark is definitely going to sure that up. Uh, but, yeah, the, I, I think that adding him to the front court rotation and everything would just change a lot of how the Grizzlies are going to be doing things next year. Uh, but, yeah, no, I, I think I, I saw everything that I wanted to from his first game. I hope that he can continue to kind of build up these next, you know, nine games left until the end of the season. Um, and then that can kind of be like a launch pad for him into his off season and into – because even though he's back, I, you know, the rehab is probably not 100% done. He still has a lot of st- work that has to go into that. Uh so hopefully, as long as he's feeling good and everything like that, he can play these last nine games. And like I said, that can just be like a launch pad into his offseason work, uh, where whether it's, you know, continuing to rehab and continuing to do that and then also working on his game. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's I think how you said it is how I describe it. I, I said it to somebody else yesterday. He looks healthy, but he looked rusty. Like, obviously, that's expected when you have played basketball. And, yeah, I mean, obviously, he's played basketball, like, you know, getting back and doing reps. But, it's again, like we always say, it's different when you play actual games versus just practicing and just doing other stuff, like workouts by yourself. Like, nothing is, like, game conditioning and all that. So, um, just the fact that he looked healthy was good. Again, um, you know, I think he was impactful. Like you said, uh, his numbers are pretty good. And, again, you don't want to always go off plus minus. I got it pulled up. But he was he had the biggest plus minus on the team in his 21 minutes that he's plus 15. So I mean, obviously, if you want to take some stock into that, I mean, um, you know, but he's always been an impactful guy. Like you don't really have to like his numbers, like, you know, it's more for me is like the eye test with him. Like he obviously just does a lot of good stuff. Like that's why I try to tell people that he was still probably gonna be a serviceable player. Now, obviously, you know, time will tell whether how he looks in terms of athletically and what you know, the, all that different, the difference of the you know him before the injury versus the after, but like I tell people, like when you have high IQ or when you have skill, just you know either war or both, like when you have those things or you possess them, like you're going to be okay. Like BC's never been like a guy like you know like I know he never been a strong shooter, and people say he relied on his athleticism a lot, which he did, but it wasn't like he was just somebody that dunked a lot. Like, he had one of the best floaters in the league. Like you said, the little push shot. He was always having that. He always had one of the best floaters in the league. He might not have the same jump on them floaters as he used to, but, I mean, he was still getting to that, those floaters. I think he missed one. I think he missed one maybe, like, it was like real, like a real easy one. Then I think he had another 
basically, I think, reverse left. He tried to do what he missed. Like, it's just easy stuff they usually make he miss. And I think, like, as, you know, in these next couple games, we'll see, you know, we, you know, we might see him make it, we might see him miss it, but I'm just glad that he's out there looking healthy. Um, Obviously, defensively look fine. Like, you know, again, high IQ player. Um, And, yeah, he just looked healthy. I'm glad that he's back. Obviously, it seemed like, you know, the team was excited for him. The crowd was obviously excited for him because they knew, you know, he's been gone for a whole year, which is kind of crazy when you think about it. Um, just what has happened and what has transpired in that year <laughs> from then to now. Uh, but yeah, no, it's, it was good to see him back, uh, obviously. And then again, I hope he that again, like you said, continues to build on it. Cause again, this is all about stepping stones for next year, you know, like building towards next year. Um, so, you know, again, just him hopefully having, you know, getting these reps on his belt, you know, will help him going into the off season. Cause again, this will be, you know, he didn't have an offseason last year since this is rehab. So now you're past that rehab stage. Now you can work on your game and, you know, redefine your game or whatever you want to do in the offseason. So, uh, but, yeah, it was great to see BC back. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think, like I said, that was, like, the main takeaway for me was just to see him out there and look healthy. Uh, it didn't look – it looked like he trusted, you know, all his move, movements and anything. And it looked like he was playing like he was worried about getting hurt again or stuff like Sometimes you'll kind of see that when guys first come back is maybe if they're not as active, they're not going for as many loose balls. They might not be, you know, kind of stuff like that. But I felt like he did all of that very well. Um, as a whole, this was like that Lakers game in general. It was an interesting game for me because it was one of the first times where the Grizzlies defense is what failed them rather than their offense because they put up 124 points which this season, like, has not been – it hasn't happened many times. Like, it hasn't happened many times. Like, I think I tweeted, one like, one time last night, it's like, dude, I'm just glad we're scoring over 100 again. Like, that's – like, I'm glad Bain's back. They're scoring over 100 again. But that was really the difference is they have Desmond Bain, man. And, I mean, 16 assists I'm mean, from a guy who's not even a true point guard is, like, really ridiculous. I mean – Obviously, it was his career high, and I think the way he did it, I mean, obviously, when he's out there with the level of guys he's playing with right now, he's not playing with, you know, the usual starting lineup he's going to see, like, next season. Uh, he's going to see a lot more attention, but I think he's done a good job of, like, getting his teammates involved when that does happen, whether it's a pick-and-roll thing, whether it's somebody closes out and he's making the quick swing pass and everything like that, uh, and just keeping the ball moving. Because I feel like at times, like, there's a lot of players that they'll say, okay, we got a bunch of dudes out here that are two-way contracts, rookies, people that were in the G League. So I'm just going to take over. And while he did still take 17 shots, and, I, and I'd be fine if he took 25 on a night like last night, I do like that he tried to get everybody involved and then also opened it up for a guy like Jake LaRavia to have a career night as well. And he like, dude, I got to talk about Jake because I know we like early in the season, everybody was really rough on him because, I mean, you know, he was a first round pick and he wasn't playing like it. But if you look at these last like 15 games, like he's he's been playing really well, at least offensively. I think defensively he can still get better. Obviously, there are some matchups where he just doesn't have the foot speed to stay in front of people. But. I mean, he's he's a hard worker on defense. Uh, he gets a lot of offensive rebounds. He attacks the glass really well, and I really like that. And then the jumper is starting to fall, like, at a much higher rate than it was because that was my thing. It's like they drafted you. If you get drafted to be a shooter, like, that is what they need you. You, got, you can't be sub 35% from three. Exactly. And that's what he had been. But, I mean – but if you're going to be 9 out of 14, I'm not saying he's going to be 9 out of 14 every night. But, I mean, 9 out of 14, if you're going to be, you know, 36, 37, like that's all I'm asking for. If you can be 37, 38%, like you're there to be a shooter, you need to at least – like that. that's what I need Jake to be if he's going to be like a rotation piece. Uh, but I think 11 out of his last 14 games in double figures, I don't even – I haven't looked at it. But I can almost guarantee you that he's had more double figures games since he came back from injury than he had his whole career before this. Like that's that, that's what it feels like. So this is the best stretch he's played, and 
I think it's good for him because it also continues to give the Grizzlies more options. Because, like I said, if you do bring him back, okay, you've now seen him play at this level. And then now you also have, if you do decide to move on, you have tape that you can show to these other teams to be like, hey, this is what he did at the end of the season. We had consistent minutes and he was healthy. So it's like, it's not like we're just trying to sell you on somebody that just can't play at all. You know what I mean? Like we now have film of him in the catch and shoot, making step back threes, doing a bunch of like doing stuff that I I hadn't seen in his bag before. So I got to give Jake LaRavia credit uh, in that game last night as well. I thought he played really well. Yeah. Uh, to go back to the Bane point, I didn't even realize he had 16 assists until somebody said it. I think it was in the timeline or in the group chat. I was like, yeah, 16. Like, I didn't even realize that he had that many assists. But like you said about him, just the playmaking, just continuing to get better is obviously a big part of what will, you know, will, will help us going into next year when, you know, you add more talent and you add job back. Um, you know, but again, again, for Bain, really, again, just being out there has helped. Like you said, the, the offense, like, like you said, they hadn't scored this many points in a minute. I, I think this might have been the first time they scored like this many points in a I, I, I have to go look, but it, the last time I remember scoring as many points was like Houston right before All Star break, and that's been like a crazy while, like a long time ago. So, you know, obviously, uh, like you said, they couldn't really get the stops, which again doesn't really surprise me, just because again, when you have so many guys in and out the lineup, then you add somebody who hasn't played in a year. Obviously, BC still good defensively, but again, defense a lot of it has to do with chemistry. A lot of these guys have played together a lot barely you know this was scotty's like second or third game but like nobody's really played together so the chemistry defense is gonna be off a little bit um but um you know it just it happens you know this is expected in this situation but uh as for jake laravia yeah now he's playing played a lot better but like you said for me uh mainly for what i've expected and my expectation again is you when you're drafted to be a shooter and not only drafted to be a guy that can shoot the ball that's where your nba value is i think Somebody said it to me, like Jake LaRavia could be a, end up being like a bigger John Conchar, but that's an NBA player to me, but that's still a back-end rotation guy. And even then, you need him in this situation. You don't need a bigger John Conchar. I mean, it helps. He's cheap. And again, if they want to say, hey, we can, you know, like you said, either, either they want to sell high on the, you know, which is, you know, I'm all pro, all, all for selling high. Uh, on these players, but if they said they want to keep Jake because he's on a cheap contract and he does what Contar does, we can and he's cheaper. I wouldn't be mad at it. But again, for him, all of this for him, if he wants to be a real legit NBA player, a lot of it's gonna come down to can you make the reason not? Like I know it sounds like I'm being harsh, but that's just that simple. In today's league and his role for not only this team but his role anywhere, they're probably gonna expect him to hit shots. That's just what it is. So you know, if he's gonna continue to hit shots, he can again. You know, he's gonna have some type of value on this team that they might not want to move. Him. But again, like, you know, I mean, Kleiman even said it, like, there's a lot of opportunity to go around now. Like, he, you know, I remember they asking about Jake and Zaire, he, you know, he's like, hey, they have a lot of opportunity in these games. And now, you know, obviously Jake has had some unlu uh, some unlucky injuries. Like, again, you know, he can't stand the football. Some of it is just, you know, bad luck. A lot of it, I, I, like, I, I like to compare him to uh, Jordan Adams when we had Jordan Adams. And Jordan Adams was like a, a player that, you know, seemed like he had talent. Or he did have talent. I mean, I say seen he did have talent, but he could never stay on the floor. Like he was always hurt, and then just ended up, you know, fizzling out. Like that happens. Uh, and so for Jake, you know, again, like you said, he's not really being great defensively, but he's getting he's been giving effort. You know, I think he's been playing hard. He's been rebounding uh, for the most part. Um, again, for me, it's about hitting shots offensively. Like, you know, because again, you can you you can always play hard, but I need you to contribute. Like, no disrespect to David Roddy no more, but like obviously. Dave Roddy, I felt like he never not play hard. He just couldn't score. Like, you know, at some point you can always, like, you know, people always want people to play hard, but are you producing or not at the end of the day? I, you can play hard and it can help you out, but it, sometimes you got to put some something to you playing hard has to be manifested into production. So for me, I think Jake is doing that and hopefully it continues because, again, you know, I, you know, I want, you know, I don't want people to be bad. I want players to be good on this team. I don't want to have to continue to keep talking about Zach Klein and be like, man, can you give me good NBA players? I want to do this every time. I want to do this the whole summer. I want to do this the whole time. I want I want players to be good. Now, if it makes me – if I have to joke on them to be good, hey, so be it. But, um, you yeah, know, I think, you know, Jake is going to be – you know, I think, again, like hitting seven 
out of nine threes and some, like you said, some of them were step backs. Like that was kind of like I remember. I think I, I think it's the one at the top of the key. I was like, that was a kind of crazy step back. And it went, I'm okay. Like you know, like again, I, I think you know I've seen some of that in like pre, you know, like obviously off season workouts. But again, like you said, we hadn't seen it in the game. So you know, but now, I do want to. Hey, I'm telling you, look, this this must be what they saw in those play groups that we keep hearing about, Brad. Oh I yeah, them hear- play groups. I keep nope. hearing about them for in the play groups. This must be, hey, I'm telling you, that's my nickname. Hey, I don't even know if it counts as a nickname, but when he play like this, that's play group Jake. That play. is play group Jake. That is what they saw in the play groups over the summer. To have that, that's that's must. This is the Jake Laravia that Desmond Bain saw this off season to make him say he's gonna be, he's gonna have the best shooting season of his career. Like this is the kind of stuff that he must have been doing. And it took it took him a minute to get here, but like I took said, it a march. Yeah, but we're took, here. <laughs> but we're here. <laughs> but we're here. Well, maybe in the February. We'll give him in the February. Yeah. But hey, better yeah. late than never. Better late than hey, never. Hey, no, that's that's facts. Better late than never. Uh, the other thing we got to get to from this game, I don't, there's not a ton I want to talk about this game. Honestly, I mean, first of all, Rui, listen, I don't know what. I don't know what Memphis did to Rui. Like, because he was even talking after the game. He was like, I don't really like the city. I don't know what Memphis did to Rui, but I'm like, he, you only need to stop taking it out on the Grizzlies. And on the Grizzlies side, I'm like, dang, y'all still think he can't shoot? Like, how is he still getting wide open? He just cooked for the whole playoff series. That whole playoff series last year. And he's still getting the open looks. Like, I, like, I know there's, there's sometimes – I, I, I try not to let it get to me because there's injuries and all this, but there's just some simple things. I'm like, dude, y'all know the type of dude that this guy is now. Like, y'all got to find a way to not let him get open looks. And they just had – I mean, they allowed LeBron to basically sit back. I mean, he had 23, but he was just orchestrating the offense. And he was giving the ball to D'Lo, giving the ball to Rui. Uh, giving the ball to Reeves, giving the ball to Dinwiddie, and all those guys were really cooking as well. So that was really what I thought was the story of the game for the for the Grizzlies. They just couldn't get stops. But I had to bring up LeBron because it was pretty cool yesterday because we had the oldest player in the NBA versus the youngest player in the NBA. To put into context how much older LeBron James is than G.G. Jackson, I made a tweet last night. G.G. Jackson was born December 17th, 2004. And on December 18th, 2004, the next day, LeBron James had 31 points against the Celtics. So that is – not only was LeBron already drafted and in the NBA, he was in his second season. He was in year two. He had already won rookie of the year. He already had a rookie of the year trophy at his house. When G.G. Jackson was born. And I just think that's crazy. Uh, LeBron kind of talked about seeing him at Peace Jam and stuff like that when he was in high school. And the fact that he was on CP3's AAU team, which we heard Chris Paul kind of talk about that as well. Uh, He was on, like, Team CP3 or whatever. So uh, I I thought that was pretty cool. And then G.G. G.G. might be the funniest player in the NBA. Like, I think I said earlier today that I think Dylan Brooks is still the funniest player in the NBA because of what happened the other night, because uh, he, he finds a way to put himself into anything. But in terms of post-game quotes, Gigi Jackson might be the funniest player in the NBA. Because between that one, where they asked him if he had anything with LeBron, and he was like, besides him, you know, shooting <laughs> shooting fadeaways and messing us up, like, no. Like, that was pretty funny. Uh, and then he said that he didn't think, Brandon Clark would be as fast as he was because he, he he has his speed slow on 2K. And I was like, yeah, this is sometimes we're like, yeah, this man is really 19. Like, that's a 19-year-old answer. So it's just, like, funny to see that. And it's like, so on that side, you got Gigi. And then on the other side, you got all-time leading scorer, 40K, 11K, 10K, points, rebounds, assists, you know, arguably greatest of all time. And it was just really cool to even see, you know, Gigi get to guard him sometimes. Because, I mean, that it's just, like, this is something that you don't see a lot. Like, you don't see a dude playing as well as LeBron is at that age. And then you also don't see a player as young as Gigi 
usually anymore. Like you don't really see that as much as you once did. So it's kind of it's kind of cool to see like the in, both ends of the spectrum where you have one dude who came in at 18 and now he's about to be 40 and he's still doing it. And then you have another guy who came in when he was 18 is now 19 years old and he's kind of finding his way in the league. And I just thought I thought I thought that was really cool just to see how that interaction happened and everything. Yeah, no. Shout out to uh shout out to Gigi, man. Yeah, no. And by the way, for for anybody that actually watched the clip, he didn't say messing. He said F him. The F word, but we can't say that right here. But it was funny. Very funny because of how he said it. It was very, 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 very funny. Uh, but you know, Gigi, yeah, no, he 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 has answers where he you can tell like he's 19. But I mean that was the same way with uh when Jaren was that age. Like he when because Jaren was the youngest player when he came in, he was like 19 and he had answers where you like yeah that dude, that dude's like 19 like you can just tell like but it, that's fine you know that's okay like it's not a bad thing i don't think it's a bad thing at all especially if you don't get interviews like that's what makes uh you know those guys like those players like well, what they are or, you know the type of charisma and stuff like you know the character personality that they have you know that helps them in terms of if they become stars you know that they have that type of charisma but uh you know it was kind of crazy because i didn't re- I forgot about it, you know, that LeBron is the oldest player in the league. Obviously, I knew, you know, he is old, but I forget that he's the oldest player. Usually the oldest player in the league is not one of the top 10, 15 players in the league. That just usually doesn't happen, so I forget about it. Because usually you, usually if you're the oldest player in the league, that usually means you, like, you shout out to Udonis Haslam. Like, usually, like, you, Udonis Haslam, you barely playing. You're more of a vet. You know, you 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 getting the young, you know, you being the mentor to the young guys. You know, you're not really playing, but, again, you still have an impact. No, Brian said that. No, I'm out here getting tri- triple doubles and stuff like that, and you know, and still being uh, like you, you know, obviously nobody's gonna say most people are not saying he's the best player in the world, but like most people say, oh, he's still like top 10, 15 player in the world. Like that's kind of and again, that's a crazy standard. But I didn't think about it until they showed it on the actual uh, TV, like the broadcast, where it's like Gigi's the youngest player in the league and LeBron's the oldest player in the league, and like they showed like the age difference. I'm like, that's crazy, like you know. And then obviously Bryson tweet. I was like, yeah, that that, that that's wild too, because I I didn't think about it like that. Where were you at on this day? Like I, I didn't think about that. Like I didn't think about all that. Like, and then I was talking. I said, like, yeah, just it just it it's really crazy when you think about stuff like that. It's only gonna happen. It's only going to continue to happen because uh, you know I think Brian gonna play another what maybe two three years, probably three maybe four. I don't know. You know he 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 gonna stop whenever he wants to stop. But the point is, it's just gonna be the same with the next next class. You know you're gonna have somebody young and. Because GG looked up LeBron. I remember him talking about it in his interview with, um, with KJ. I think he said something like he was, like, really excited to play against LeBron because that was the dude he, you know, like, he grew up with LeBron, like, 04, like, born in 2000. Like, he grew up with LeBron James. Like, I mean, I kind of did too. I mean, me, you know, I kind of did too being, what, 25. But, like, you know, I saw a little bit young, you know, like, I saw Kobe, you know, right at, you know, maybe, like, right at, still at his prime and stuff like that. For him? When Gigi was what? If he had 2004, when he was like 10, he was seeing LeBron, like prom LeBron James still, like Miami LeBron James. Like that's a totally different thing uh, when you think about the age difference. So uh, it's just, it's wild. Like he's part of that generation that grew up with LeBron. So for like them, like LeBron is their quote unquote goat, like, you know, for some of them. Um, and so, you know, they, when they get to actually play against them and actually, like you said, guard them, like, I bet that was crazy for him. Cause he's like, oh yeah, I got to guard this, this old man. And then, and like he said, just hitting, then it started settling once LeBron started, like he said, just hitting fadeaways and messing them up, you know, then it kind of settled in probably. He's like, yeah, like I got to actually guard this dude. But yeah, no, that, that was a funny, that is a funny thing. But yeah, no, um, yeah, it's just going to continue to happen just cause you know, again, LeBron's going, he doesn't, it, you know, father time, he, he, he's, he's not undefeated, but you know. He's 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 pushing the he's pushing the limits. He's he's fighting back by the time. You know what I mean? They're going like you know like like a like you know in a boxing match. Like I don't know how many rounds, but like they're they're fighting. And so Brian's just gonna keep doing this, and you know the next class is gonna be the same way. They're gonna be like, oh, we got somebody young like this. The youngest player in the league goes against Brian, and he's gonna have he's gonna have like twenty. He's gonna have like twenty five seven and seven against them. And you know he's gonna dap him up after the game like he, you know, like he's just. The the older older the old the OG basically like Uncle Drew essentially that's what he's becoming like Uncle Drew essentially so yeah nah that's crazy yeah no because like you said especially for anybody born like I, I like I'm a couple years older than Gigi obviously but like 
I can't remember what the NBA life was was like before LeBron. Like, obviously, like you said, I remember watching Kobe and I remember watching Shaq and, like, some of those guys, Kevin Garnett, like, you know, the, the, on that Celtic scene with Paul Pierce. Like, like, I remember those guys, like, kind of before LeBron kind of became the LeBron we know him as now. Like, he was still putting up numbers. But that was, like, back when they were still making memes about LeBron having no rings, like, that era. But LeBron was always, like, on the come up, like, even when I first started watching the NBA. So, like, that's got to be crazy to be like, this is somebody who's been in the NBA as long as you can remember and has been in the NBA, was already in the NBA for a full season in his second year when you were born. Like, yeah, it's it's ridiculous. And we'll continue to see that kind of like we said, because I'd agree. I think he's probably going to play a couple more years, uh, especially waiting until Bryce gets there. Uh, but just, we'll see what happens with that. I think he wants to play with both of his kids. But, yeah, you said Father Tom's still undefeated, definitely. But LeBron does have him on the ropes. And that's one thing I do try to say is, like, regardless of what you think about him, like, you got to respect it at this age, doing what he's doing. It's crazy. So that's why, like, last night, like, seeing LeBron do that, I'm like, it's, it's like, what can you do? He's been, He's been doing it for 21 years, man. Uh, but kind of moving on from somebody who's been doing it for that long to – talking about some people that might be having a good career coming forward, coming in this next season. We've both been watching a lot of March Madness games. I know I have. I know Alex has. We've been texting, talking, and talking about some of the players that we like, some of the teams we like and stuff like that uh, from the teams that, you know, some some already got eliminated. Uh, like some of the players I was watching, like Cody Williams got eliminated with Colorado. You know, Rob Dillahab got eliminated with Kentucky. Uh we got apparently let's just undrafted free agent Jack Golkey, you know, Memphis Grizzly. No, nah, I'm kidding. But <laughs> uh that was like that whole thing was just crazy to watch. Uh, but in terms of the people that are still there, I know we kind of talked about it. I want to start with the guy who I've seen the most people either be I've seen him be mocked to the Grizzlies a lot, and I've seen a lot a lot of people talk about him, and that's Donovan Klingon for UConn. And the reason I wanted to start with him is because he fits a positional need 100%. We know the Grizzlies need a center. I, he has legit, like, size. Like, size-wise, he has the height and he has the length to be a true NBA center. Like, he is legit 7'1", maybe even 7'2". Like, like he, like, he is a physically imposing big man on the interior. Um, I think offensively, I don't know if he has a lot that translates directly into the NBA in terms of him being like an offensive hub or him being somebody you throw the ball to in the post in the NBA. I don't see that. But the things I like the most about his game is like defense and rebounding. Like he's a really good run protector. Uh, he had 14 rebounds and eight blocks in their last NCAA tournament game. And then I think he's, he's a good passer. And I think that's really underrated in terms of like assist percentage and stuff like that. He's very high uh, in college basketball. And I saw a clip on Twitter of some of his passes and stuff that he's made. And I feel like that could open them up to, if the Grizzlies did decide to draft him, that would open him up to do some of the stuff that they did with Steven Adams, where he might have the ball kind of at the elbow and he's hitting like Desmond Bain on that cut to get him an easy basket and stuff like that. Like, I think he is a good enough passer to do stuff like that. The only doubt, like the only downsides from him for me is one is his health history. I know he's had some foot injuries and then just mobility in general. Not to say that he can't move. I think he can move, but it's just like, can he get faster than he is now, though? Like, I think that's going to be the question. Because I think right now, I think he, he's fast enough to play. But if he can kind of like, if he can just get like a step quicker, right on some of those rotations i know he like he had eight blocks in that game if he was a step quicker on his rotations he could have had 15 blocks like he legit could have had like 15 blocks in that game i was watching it so i think in the nba he's gonna have to be a step quicker to even get to you know three four you know if he's gonna have that uh but i think the biggest thing is it's just a big body you can have down there he's gonna get rebounds he's gonna be able to box out and he's going to get some putbacks and stuff like that, which I think that is also good for what the Grizzlies would need at that position. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. Everybody, every Grizzly fan loves uh, Donovan. Um, I'm, I'm not, you know, again, I understand it. And I am a fan, but I want to preface this before I start saying good and bad things about this fan. Or I, before I start talking about him in a good or bad way, I want to preface this by saying, for me with the lottery pick, with the Grizzlies, it's going to be a pick that obviously is going to help. But for me, anybody outside of probably, if it's Alexander Saar, I'm looking at in, in the role of, hey, they're playing in the back end of the rotation more so than they are playing like 25, 30 minutes uh, before anybody, you know, and which, again, they could be a future piece. But, again, I don't want to depend on anybody in this draft class to be somebody that we're like, hey, we got to have them in the playoff eight or nine, which is okay. That's fine. That's why you got this lottery pick because that helps you, you know, for the future and without, you know, sacrificing in the short term as well. But with that being said, with him, obviously fits a positional need. Again, 7'2", I think what they say, 7'7", seven, seven wingspan. So he has size, like he has the center size. And obviously with him, uh, can finish inside, he rebounds. He's good in drop coverage. He's a solid playmaker. And obviously that's a lot of stuff that the Grizzlies like to do with their centers, like or that's how they play in the system. For me, again, like you said, it's about his speed. For me, can you guard in space? That's why, I, you know, I, I'm a fan of his game, but there might be other bigs that I like. And maybe, you know, we'll talk about them, obviously, as we go into the offseason and, you know, later in the season. You know, we'll talk about other prospects. But, like, that's what worries me because, again, you're talking about a guy who is slow in space or can't defend in space. And, again, for me, if you're going to be starting five, you got to be – for me, if you're going to be a player or a center or somebody like that, for me, at least from what this team needs, you might have to sometimes finish games with Jaron. And if you can't do that, then you're not going to be. Because, again, no disrespect to Steven Adams, but that was his problem. That was my problem with him. He was not a really good guy in space or guarding on the perimeter. And and not only that, he wasn't a great free throw shooter. Uh, Donovan's not a bad – I don't know what his percentage are, but he's not a great free throw shooter either. So when you not only are not a good free throw shooter, and then on top of that, you can't guard in space. In today's NBA where it's a game of switchability and mismatches, that limits your ceiling on what you can do if you can't do those things. So that's really where the pushback is for me. But for me, if depending on where the pick falls and this and that, I wouldn't be mad at the pick like if he was there. I think he's a good prospect. And again, if he does show up, hey, if they can somehow hide him and only play him drop coverage, if he continues to improve his conditioning, like you said, and obviously the entry concern is another thing. But for me, that's with any seven footer, like seven footers historically just have bad, in, you know, like injury history like it's a word because they're so big and move like that like you're going to always have injury history like or not injury history but you're going to always have injury concerns like so i'll be yeah i mean shoot, even kd who seven foot had two foot surgeries or jerry jackson on our team had a stretch right like marcus all before like every big man damn near is like going to have injuries not or have that risk just because of how what the sport they play and what they do but um yeah i i, I think he's a good player obviously um you know again i i think for him, another thing, too, is how much can you develop offensively? Because, again, if he could somehow extend his range from just being like a post guy, can he shoot a mid-range jump shot? Can he shoot from three? Could that help his game? Because I think that could maybe compensate for him having a lack of foot speed because now offense you have to guard him out there, which opens up the, uh, the floor more for everybody else. But, uh, yeah, no, I think he's a good prospect. I wouldn't, uh, He does seem like a Grizz-type prospect. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I think I, I'm interested to see how – he continues to play in the tournament because, um, I mean, I think he's going to play well. I, th- I mean, for me personally, in my bracket, I had UConn. The one I made with my friends, I had UConn in, winning the, the whole thing just because I think, you know, for especially in college, it's a different game than the NBA. And for him, he's going to dominate. I, again, no three seconds. Like, you stand around. Like, it's just easy. And there's nobody really 7'2 or in 265 pounds. Like, and he had experience from last year. So I expect him, you know, continue to play well. But, no, I do think he's a good prospect that, I would assume that it's high on the Grizzlies board in some type of way because, again, like you said, the main thing is the position they need. He is a, a center, and they didn't just get their whole rock center position just to not look at centers in the draft. I'm not saying they're going to take one, but it, we'd, be, we'd be foolish to not think they're looking at every center prospect in this draft very closely. So um, I'll just leave it at that. But, yeah, you know, yeah I think for sure. No, there's, there's no question that they're going to be looking at any kind of center – like, even some – I know we're talking about ones that make the tournament, like Khalil Ware, he didn't make the tournament. I hope they're looking at him as well. 
Um, talking about uh, Deron Holmes, too, from Dayton. I thought he he's a good prospect. Uh, they didn't make it. I, I kind of thought they would have a chance to beat Arizona. They didn't make it. They, they, didn't, they weren't able to pull off that upset. But I still think that he has played well and he's played his way probably into a late first, early second round pick for him. So that's two other guys I look at. Uh, Cal Filipowski from Duke. I think he's kind of been up and down, but I did like what I saw from him in his last game. He wasn't necessarily like he's he's not going to be a dominant offensive player, but he's a dude. He's going to get rebounds. He's going to pass the ball and move the ball around very well. And I think that playing in an NBA system, he could be better than he is for Duke right now. Uh, but just in terms of like position and need, I think Klingon, just because looking at where the Grizzlies are picking and their position and need, Klingon is probably going to be the best center available when they pick. Now, the question is going to be, are they going to draft a center? Or are they going to go after somebody else? Are they going to go and try to like pick up pick up somebody, or are they going to draft a center and also pick somebody up? But I think if they draft a center in the lottery, even though you might want them to kind of come off the bench, I think they are drafting them in the lottery because they think eventually that's the person that's going to be next to Jaron. It might not be his rookie year, but like eventually that's what you're drafting. Uh, but if they go in another direction, like maybe not in the lottery, like the other direction is like the trade back direction, I'd say. Uh, which we'll see. I don't know. I don't know how likely that is, but I think this is one, like if you were going to trade back in a draft, this would be the draft to trade back in. Because I think if you go one through 15, one through 20 of guys in this draft, not to say that obviously there's like tears a little bit, but it's like, there's not much separating the top five picks from pick 15 to 20, right? That, that, and go even coming into the tournament, there's a lot of stuff that is still going to be changing around. And then going into the draft combine and stuff, there's a lot – like every mock draft you look, there might be in one mock draft he might be third, and then another mock draft he might be 15, 16. Uh, a couple other guys, um, if they don't go in the center direction and they want to go in the guard direction uh, – one of the guys I like, I like Tyler Kolick. Um, this will be like a second round pick, most likely, if he falls there, to be kind of like a backup point guard kind of guy. Also like Stefan Castle as well. Uh, I know. So for me, the reason I said Kolick is just because of the way that he plays in the pick and roll. Like I saw a video and it had to be like five, ten minutes, and it was just videos of him running the pick and roll all season whether it was in tournament games, whether it was early in the season, it didn't really matter. And it's just like he makes the right read every time. And he has a little bit of a dog in him too. Like he's he's a trash talker. Uh, like he'll say stuff. I, I saw like an interview from him where he said a dude was barbecue chicken in the post game. Like, and I just feel like stuff like that, that fits like kind of the Grizzlies kind of culture a little bit. Uh, and then like Stefan Castle is kind of, like, I think we mentioned it the last time, but I think it continued in the tournament. Is he kind of does everything but shoot the ball very well? Like, he's not going to be a great three point shooter, but he's going to do everything else. So, if they don't go into center position and they're kind of looking for like a guard, I think those are two guys they would look at. But uh, early in the draft, I mean, you probably look at Rob Dillingham uh, early on, which obviously Kentucky didn't play well. Uh, and some people are going to have Reed Shepard in that top 10 as well. I don't know if I can take him top 10, but I wouldn't be surprised if he does go top 10 because he does have some good things about his game. But kind of like what we saw in that game, I don't know if I want to use that pick on somebody. Like, okay, this is a guy who you're picking him to be a shooter and a scorer, and you saw him in the tournament game kind of just have a just disappear kind of. He didn't score any points. And I know that you can't always just look at one game and be like, oh, this is the one game he played bad, so now don't draft him. He's undraftable. Like, I'm not going that far. But to me, it's like the NCAA tournament. I think I said it on one of our other podcasts. It shows you what they're going to do when everything is on the line. And if you struggle 
And even if you struggle, but you come out with a win, um, if, you, if you are six for 20 and your team wins, I can live with that, right? But to have no points in a game where you're playing a 14 seed and you lose in the first round, I just that, that's just not a good look for somebody that I'm going to try to take with a top five pick. Uh, but I still think, like, he's talented enough to be that. So, uh, but, like, just because of the way this class works and everything, I wouldn't be surprised if he still goes top ten. Yeah, again, this class is <laughs> – this class, the range of prospects that could go anywhere is, is crazy. Like like I said, anybody – I'll say anybody could be top 10, 15, but I, I, it feels that way just because of where you look at and how people talk about these players. Um, but I, I guess I, if I had to bring up prospects that I'd say look at or that I would like for the Grizzlies, I know I've been – if anybody knows me, I've been pro – not taking smaller guys because again we already pay as many small guys as we do. But I'm gonna say this: if they are second round, late first, I'm more open to idea. Like the name that uh, Bryson mentioned, I'm more open to him if it's like a second round guy, this and that. Because again, not you know you're not expecting him to play right away. Like this is for future long term. So I'd say when one guy that it fits that mold, oh, not fit that mold, but he's more of a late, more of a second round, late first guy is um uh, his teammate Cam Jones. Uh, from Marquette, he is a Memphis kid. Um, I do think Cam Jones is like a really good just score that can, you know, and because again, I, I think a lot of people, you know, and 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 that talk about the Grizzlies, uh, we got no bench scoring, nobody can score the bench. This dude can make shots, he can create his own shot. He's six five, so he basically be a combo guard, but he's not a small combo guard. Six five, he's basically close to two, more of a two. Or he's more of a shooting guard, maybe even small forward size, depending on the lineup. Um, he is a little bit older. I, I guess you could say he is 22, junior, upperclassman. But, again, he is a guy that I do think that, you know, if you want to say down the line, you know, if you want to get him and be like, hey, he can grow into this bench score for the Grizzlies or whatever off the for us, you know, where that way we don't really have any fall off where we, you know, where Jai comes out the game or Bain comes out the game, I think is another dude um, or person that they can look at. Um, obviously, Furphy. From Kansas, another guy that I've been high on, just because I think, um, again, six six nine, six eight wing, um, basically that can hit shots. has a has a track record of hitting shots, and comes from I think he I think if he not mistaken he's from Australia. I think he played. I can't remember if he played in the NBA. I think he did, but he has already been a pro. And again, I think he can play a different role. Like he he's very scalable. I'm always big on guys that are scalable because they can fit any role. And um, he's a guy that obviously at Kansas before obviously they got eliminated was a guy that throughout the whole season, he kind of was like more of a rotation guy. Then he would start, you know, then he became a starter and play well and had to go back to the bench. Like he kept, regardless of what his role was, he produced. And even I think his game before his last one, or he, I think he had like 20 in that first game. So he's another guy that I look at. Um, as for in the tournament, like you said, Castle's another one. I guess you could say, that you know, that that's, that's good. I mean, uh, connect from Tennessee. I'll give him a, a look, you know, again, like a lot of these guys fit the thing that it fit the Grizzlies because, because again, we've said it. We're not the only people that have said it, but a lot of these guys for this class, if you already have your stars, it's really good class in that sense, because a lot of these guys could fit a role that you need. You know what I mean? Like it, if you're trying to draft somebody in this class, depending on where you're at and you're thinking you're going to franchise thing, change or maybe an all-star, that might be it, it, that's all situation dependent, but that might be reaching a little bit depending on most of these prospects, but it's not, the, it wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if you find a lot of these guys and they end up having like 10, 15 year, year careers. Like I know you talked about Reed Shepard and he didn't play well in that game. For me, when it comes to guys playing well in the tournament, like obviously a whole stock, but I always say context matters. You always got to consider the context of when they played what they're playing through, how they were out of plan, how they're, you know, how they're playing in the sense of that system, who they're playing against, you know. And so, like, because, again, like, people were trying to do that to Brandon Miller last year when he didn't play well in the tournament, not knowing he played through injury, not knowing that, again, the rules are different. College ball is way different than NBA ball. And now look at him. You know, he's a guy that in the rookie year race, I mean, he's third in the rookie year race, but, you know, everybody was, you know, essentially killing Charlotte for taking him at two, and he looks like a really good player. So you can't always put too much stock into these games. Obviously, you look at it and you observe it, you know, like the certain things that translate to the NBA game, but you don't put, you know, you know, you don't say it's the end-all, be-all. 
Um, but I do think a lot of these players have a chance to be good. And I think that's the good spot for the Grizzlies where they already got three guys on max level money. They're not, and again, maybe, you know, and then when you already have the emergence of GG, they're going to have, hopefully, if that somehow becomes their core four guys, essentially, they're not going to be able to pay anybody else at a star level. So they need guys that can fit around those guys. So, and I think a lot of these players in this draft have the potential to do that. So, um, yeah, it'd be interesting to see where they fall and all that. Yeah, for sure. And I'm glad you mentioned Dalton, so I didn't have to. Don't connect. I'm glad you went ahead and said. I did because I listen. I did because I already knew people was gonna be like, "Hey, you ain't mentioned Don't connect." I know he's good. (laughs) I understand. He's gonna say Bryson gonna say it before I did. So I I give him a mention. I I give him. I give him. No, no. I'm glad you said it because I think it's gonna be interesting. Just because, like I said, I think they they might be higher. Like they just because of where the pick falls. Like the first couple picks are probably going to be guys that are from overseas, guys the G League night. Like I'm, expe- you know, Sar, Ron Holland, Uzalis, uh, Rishisher, like all those guys are guys that aren't playing in like college right now. So if we're talking about college guys, though. Like that's that's why I said it would be mostly be like if they trade back. Uh, the reason I like Dalton is because. He has a very NBA like scalable game. Like the way that he plays in college, I think translates very well because they they run him off a lot of screens and he does a lot of catch and shoot stuff. But then he's also able to be like a ball handler in the pick and roll to where you can run like some inverted pick and roll stuff where if you want to bring like a guard or somebody to set a pick for him and he, he's getting better at his passing. He's not a, like a natural passer. I think that would be like one knock is that there are times where maybe he doesn't make the right read and he does take a couple contested shots. Uh, But I I like the fact that he still gets to the mid range. He kind of, he tries to do like a little KD, a little fadeaway midi. Like he loves that shot. And then he's just, he's a hard ball driver. Like he drives the ball super hard. And when he finish, when he finishes it, like sometimes it feels like he's finishing with like both hands. Like, he's going up like he's going to dunk, but he's just laying it up really hard off the backboard. So it's almost like he – like, that. that's really what I see sometimes. And not to say that he can't dunk because he's dunked on people and stuff too. But, like, you can't always dunk, right? So you got to be able to finish, like, through contact, which I think he's done. And, I mean, anytime you have a dude that transfers from, like, a mid-major school into a Power 5 conference like the SEC and then you win player of the year – that shows me that not only like not only are you a hooper, but you're able to adapt to like how your teammates are playing. You're able to adapt to a new situation very well. Like so it's almost like not like not to say the jump from playing at Northern Colorado to playing at the SEC is gonna be the same level. I still think the jump from college to the NBA is a way bigger jump. But it's almost like you see a guy, and I think you can see this with the transfer portal in general. It's almost like you get to see like a like a run through of what it's going to look like for them going to a new team for the first time and like how they interact with their teammates and how they're going to step on people's toes and stuff like that. And if you talk like all the dudes on Tennessee, not only do they like Dalton, they felt good enough to be like, hey, nah, you are the guy. Like we've been here two, three years and you can be that guy. But I also feel like he's humble enough and stuff like that to where if he did when he comes into an NBA team. He's going to be able to play his role. He's going to be a dude that runs off screens and shoots threes mostly. Uh, is going to have drives when he can. But I like that he's not only like a specialist in the in college. Because that's another thing that I look at is most of the time people, if you're a specialist in college, it means you're probably not going to be as good at that in the NBA. Right? Because a lot of the specialists in the NBA were the best player on their college teams. Like Seth Curry is a specialist catch and shoot. He was not a specialist at Duke. You know what I mean? So that's that's kind of what I mean. Like Contavious Caldwell Pope is a catch and shoot guy. When he played <laughs> when he played in college, he on ball, dribble. I know, and that's just like some guys like they might you might not think about them, but like when you look at them in college, they have to show you that they can do much more than that. And I think I like having guys that can do more than just shoot in that like kind of three and D catch and shoot role, like a lot. Yeah. 
Um, I, again, I, 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 like you said, I, I, he he has a like you said, uh, he a lot of stuff he does you can see translating to the league. Like I said, scalable. So I wouldn't be surprised if he ends up becoming some you know really a good player. Because again, um, you know, again he he does have the size for it. I think he's what about six six. So you know, again for me that. That's great. I'm always here. If you got positional size for NBA, cool. I'm, I'm listen. No disrespect to the Grizzlies, but it feels like they have not prioritized that for the last couple times. When I when we, when they t- when it comes to drafting players or players that either have the will have the skill set of the you know some translatable NBA skill and NBA size, like either they only got one of the two. It always happens. So uh, he would fit the bill. Um, but yeah, no, I, I think again, like he's gonna. He's gonna be another guy that you know um, probably will have a, a continue to have a good tournament. Obviously, they got a, a game coming up, and uh, you know we'll you know we'll obviously keep y'all updated on how the, these players do. Because again, some of these players might end up going, you know, like them, like the first for these players in the tournament at least. The big thing for them is that this run could really, as I already said, you don't put your all into draft or to the tournament in terms of the draft and like how they play. But for them, it will help. It, it will help or hurt them because teams do look at this stuff because, you know, some teams might not value it like I do, but I'm not in, like I said, I'm not in the front office. But some of these front office teams, like you could go on a tournament run to the championship and that for like, let's say like Donovan and Castle both dominate during this tournament run and they win a championship. Like who's to say that these guys don't go like top five? Like I'm, I'm not saying like, again, who you got your top five is, who you got in your top five, but this class is so up and down. It wouldn't like, like nothing would shock me. Like nothing would shock me if Castle went like two and then Clinton went like at five or six. Cause you know, there's another team that he fit the bill in. Like Toronto's a little, another team that fits, that he fits with in terms of what his skill set does and what they need at that spot. Like it wouldn't surprise me because again, this draft is so all over the place. A lot of these class, a lot of these guys again could go, like, I wouldn't be surprised where they go or where they head, especially if they end up having a good tournament and they're winning games. Like, so it's going to be interesting to see how it goes. Um, Cause again, um, you know, I think a lot of these guys are still on really like productive teams, obviously. And, you know, I, again, I, I think that, you know, they can, sh- you know, continue to help their, you know, help their case, hurt their case, or whatever. But it'd be interesting to see. It'd definitely be um, interesting to see how this weekend plays out. Cause I know, you know, a lot of these teams, by the end of the, by the end, by next week, we'll have a lot more to talk about. So, yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I, I just love this type of time of year for basketball because you got the men's and women's, women's tournament coming up now. And that's basically going to take us right into the NBA playoffs. Uh, so, yeah, like Alex said, we'll keep you all update, updated on everything that's going on with the tournaments and stuff. Um, and then also when we get to the playoffs, I mean, we're going to keep keep Grizzlies focused but there's going to be a lot of other stuff to talk about when we come to the playoffs and everything. Because yes. especially when you look at the way the West is shaking up now, like there, I don't know what's going to happen. And it's one of those things where obviously I still wish that the Grizzlies were in it, but it's almost like, okay, we just going to get to sit back and watch the games. No other interests, just basketball fans. You know, it's not going to be no, we gonna be sad if they lose. No anxiety, no anxiety, yeah, no too. anxiety. Yeah, that's that's a good way to put it. Because it's just like as much because as much as I did, you know, I love watching basketball. After the Grizzlies lost to the Lakers last year, it was like I dang it, don't even want to watch the playoffs no more. Like I dang it, don't even want to turn the TV on. You sound like the players. <laughs> you sound I'm like telling you, like, like, like the players. Dang. That's how they be talking. Dang. Like this, I'm like, dang. So we'd be playing. We should be playing right now. Like that's the kind of stuff that I'll be thinking. But this year, I'm like, okay, all that happened, and you can just go into the playoffs, like you said, no anxiety, just enjoying basketball, which is very good. Uh, but yeah, like I always say, I appreciate everybody who listened to this week's episode of the Next Gen Podcast here on the Buff City Media Podcast Network. As always, I'm your host Bryson Wright, and I was joined by my co-host Alex Winton. And keep enjoying these basketball games, and we'll see y'all next week. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Next Gen Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, leave a like and a comment wherever you download your podcasts. Head over to www.bluffcitymedia.co 
where you will find comprehensive coverage of all things Memphis sports and how you can become an insider. We'll see you back here next time.